I'm going to be talking about uh, a, a mosaic artwork that I'm working on. First I'm going to talk about what it is and then I'll discuss the kind of the hows of how I'm going about doing it. I'm working on a two panel piece that will be dragonized and I'm basing it on this photograph of cat's eyes and another photograph of a crocodile eye. It's a two panel piece and the one of the ideas in the concept is that each panel will be an eye and when placed on the wall the imagery will command more space than it actually occupies because you'll relate to the eyes but it'll imply the rest of the beast. Because I'm going to be using both small t, tesserae, and actual rocks in the piece, I had to do some structural considerations. I will use this hardy board and you can see I have an eye, one of the eyes, just the mapping drawn out on it. But on the back side I've included more structural with this, these oak struts so that it reduces the amount of flex because these boards have to carry a considerable amount of weight with, with those rocks. So now the how. I'm using my own smalty that I'm making by fusing glass together so that I get lots of subtle differences in shades. And I'm cutting them using uh, traditional glass cutting tools and tile snips but I'm also using a hammer. The hammer that I use has one side that is carbide and the other that is just steel. One side is for cutting stone and one side is for cutting glass and I have sort of a portable hardy because I use just a um, steel chisel and I do that because I'm using lots of stone that's considerably denser than usual and I need to resharpen the, the uh, chisel surface while I'm working on the stone. I also have wrapped my handle with an absorbing, a shock absorbing wrap that's usually used for tennis rackets. And it makes it so that I can grip it well, but also the percussion of the process is reduced. So the piece has progressed and mostly I'm working on the, the eyeball part using Andamento. You can see my mapping lines so that as I lay the tesserae, I'm laying them to follow the form. In the uh, iris part of the eye, the tesserae are essentially vertical. And in the very center, it's, it's hard to see, I'm using what I call black, not black. The very center of the iris is actually a very dark red that is a translucent piece of glass so that you get a warmness to, to the black while keeping the overall tone the same. Additionally, I'm working with powdered pigments that I'm adding to the epoxy so that in each area, the underlying epoxy, if it comes up in, in between the tesserae that I'm putting fairly close together, will reflect the color and tone of that area. So white in the reflection of the eye and uh, dark charcoal gray in the iris and uh, a pale green. And these pigments are from the gamelin company 
And they're basically the pigments that are used for making uh, artist oils. They're dry and um, stable and added to the epoxy. They, they tint the epoxy whatever color I want and I can push it one way or another as much as I'm also pushing the uh, various um, tones and density and depth in the green glass. I'm keeping the surface of the eye as the surface of, of the glass so that it has that, that kind of a liquid quality and that will be contrasted by the very dull um, look of the rocks of the slag and the slate that, that will have no reflectivity to them. And building that contrast will make the eyeball look more realistic. I'd like to welcome you back into the process. As you can see, I've made considerable progress on this artwork. I'm now at the point where I'm working on the uh, grouting of the glass area. Um, some of this will not get grout, but the glass area will. And I'm doing something that I call zoning. The reflection in the eye, I will grout with a white grout so that it blends together and doesn't get set off. When you change the different colors of grout, it'll make the exact same tesserae read very differently in the finished product. So I will grout first the white when it's set up, then I will mask it off, and I will grout the iris, um, which will be done in a black grout, and that same process will be repeated for the rest of the eyeball, which will be a, a green grout. Another thing that I'm doing, as it comes to the uh, brow ridge and, and the bridge of the nose, the dimension increases. And I'm using some really rather large pieces of slag for that. And so it's necessary to add a little more structure. And what I've done, if you can see, is I have these screws that are coming up through from the back side of the cement board that will act as anchors for this heavier stone. I've completed the two dragon eye panels. I needed to put a really heavy hardwood frame on them to carry the weight. With all this stone, they ended up weighing about 65 pounds each. In the piece, I have um, several different uh, materials that have to do with fire for the dragons. The glass, of course, is kiln formed at 1550 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. There's slag, which also has some glass-like look to it because of the silica. The slag is formed in the process of um, taking ore and refining it in into uh, pig iron. And additionally, there's um, cinders from taking the pig iron and then turning it into stainless steel and lava rock. All, all of those things uh, having to do with, with fire. In this piece, I've done a, a couple of uh, things where I've taken a slightly disparate element for instance, this red piece of lava rock within the field of, of uh, gray lava and uh, slag. And having a slight disparate piece like that activates uh, an area visually without really uh, changing the overall tone much. There's another small piece of gray-green inside the field of black. There's a small piece of green slag that's been incorporated into the gray field of the slate and uh, rounded off river rock in, as the highlight in this area of uh, 
um, glass tesserae. The English word dragon comes from the ancient Greek word drakon, which is based on the verb derkomai, to see clearly, and literally means one who stares. Perhaps the concept of a watcher comes from an inherent memory when, as hunter-gatherers, we were the prey. We were stalked. Fearing the unknown was an essential survival strategy. Cultures throughout millennia have stories of monsters and dragons, from childhood monsters under the bed and fear of darkness to boogeymen, trolls, yetis, sea serpents, and on and on. Although we are culturally committed to reason and analytics today, we still need our fear of monsters to encompass the other, the unknown, and to be alert to unprocessed ideas and situations. Since art is ideas, the new insight, uh, different perspective, re-examination or combining of things in different ways, then creativity is not the known status quo. Creativity moves us forward. So in a way, as artists, we can be the dragons. Slog is watching.